beautiful people, it's Lennon. And today I wanted to share some things with you that I've been learning regarding the Hoodoo Tarot. Now I've been using this deck almost exclusively for a few weeks now um, in relation to a, a couple of other works that I've had go in like, you know, I usually read a couple of books, you know, all at the same time. I use research a lot in my tarot practice anyway, especially in terms of like my Thoth deck, if you know me at all. <laughs> Uh, and things like that. So I really like to dive deep with my decks, especially the ones that have that need. There's a lot of decks in my collection that that filter, that they have these filters on them. They have these layers on them that I just like to, to sift through, you know, like peel back like onions. And I have, like I said, a couple of decks like that and a couple of decks that just have a little bitty, you know, an L, LWB and that's it. There's really no diving that can come with, with those usually, okay? And into, unless it's intuitive diving. And that's a little bit different than what I'm talking about. There's stories within some decks that I like to dive into. Like for instance, my Thoth deck. There's a lot of layers in that in terms of occultism that I like to dive into. Then we have thing, uh, we have a deck like the Mythology of Finica Tarot, which is a high love of mine. That deck is a high love of mine. I've been drawn to it since I first saw the images. Finnish mythology. So, of course, there's stories to, to dive into with that. And upon getting this book, um, I mean, upon getting this tarot, the Hoodoo Tarot, I learned that there are actual people from history, from North America, Black American history, in this that I can, like, use to further my research. I can actually look up and there will be a story to tell with them. Um, not the whole deck. I, I wanted to touch a little bit on what I found out. Now, if you're familiar with the Hoodoo Tarot, it's kind of divided, I guess you could say, into a couple of categories. Like the Major Arcana is considered the Elders, while the Court Cards are considered Family, and then the Miners are considered the Community as a whole, and what that look may have looked like. McQuiller, she she put a lot of emphasis on the what Black American, North American looked like at a certain time, not necessarily modern. Some of it could be considered modern, but a lot of it is like flashbacks into what was, you know, and what was the lifestyle and the culture like. And if you know, this is a hoodoo tarot, so that this is about root working, right? Now, as I understand it, hoodoo in and of itself is a closed practice, closed religion. So I'm, I'm not really wanting to dive into that. I more want to dive into the people and the stories and do it in what I hope to be a loving and respectful manner today. <laughs> now, like I said, uh, we're going to kind of get right into this because we're going to turn the camera around to tell the stories of the cards that I pulled, but I'm going to kind of tell you what I did here. Like I said in the beginning, um, the deck itself is divided into three categories, elders, family, and community. And so what I wanted to do was really get in touch with self, just like I'd be using a regular tarot deck. Okay, I wanted to get in touch with myself, be in the silence, be in the now, and just shuffle, right? Just shuffle and see what comes out. But before I did that, I separated the deck into these three respective categories. So I had all the elders, all the family members, <laughs> and all the community in three, three decks. And then individually, I shuffled each deck. And when I sat with self and I kind of reflected on... The, these people, which stories in this deck are wanting to be told to you guys or to me? You know, which stories are meant for me to hear today? Which stories are made to be re are meant to be researched today? You know, let's look up some stories and which ones are going to call out? Which ones are going to jump out of the deck? Which ones are going to, which ones am I going to fold, fold over in, in this, from this deck? And how many would that be? And so I just kind of went off my intuition and, and, shuffled and and kind of tr tried to decide like how many cards in each respective pile wanted to come out wanted to be observed wanted to be researched wanted to be known wanted their story to be known and I respectfully accepted that invitation I was able to really get some good cards and I got a lot I got a lot more than I bargained for to be honest with you I thought I'd get a few from each pile but I ended up getting more than just a few from each pile. And then I even got a couple of jumpers at the very end there. So that was something special, I guess you could say. 
I researched in the book. I researched outside of the book, um, like on the internet. And I wanted to share that with you guys. So let's turn the camera around and I'll show you the cards. All right, I'm back. All right, as you can see, four cards came out when I shuffled the elders stack of the, like the elders deck, I guess you could say. The section of the elders, which are the major arcana, um, four of them came out. Now, Big Mama was actually a jumper at the end of like all my readings when I did the whole deck and tried to get some jumpers to see like what wanted to come out after the fact. And there's a big reason why she popped out, uh, which is pretty, pretty cool. Now, of all of these, I think Gullah Jack is the only one that had like an actual history, an actual story. The rest of them are just like concepts, cultural concepts and things like that. But I still thought that maybe there was a place there. Um, like a place that wanted to be referenced and, and wanted to be explored a little. So the first one that came out was courting, which is the lover's card. Now this card tells the story of courtship in terms of social status and how marriage back in those days uh, in, colon in the colonial era, era of the U.S. was a business transaction, right? So it would have been what the guidebook calls economic upward mobility. So the, the whole family, the whole, both families would have been involved in this attachment. And I like that this image here is the couple courting. Now this, it also goes to tell the story that dating is not courting. Dating is just that fun, get to know you stage where nothing's, you know, nothing is set in stone. No commitments are being made. It's just kind of frivolous fun. Um, just to try to get to know someone. But then once they find that they, that the, either the attachment is beneficial for all parties involved, like that means both sides of the family, um, the transactions leading somewhere, uh, then, then that turns into a courtship, which is a commitment to one another as a couple that will be married one day. So I guess that was interesting to find out, even though I know a little bit about that from my own Southern background. <laughs> but furthermore, it would have included the influence of these two grandmother figures. Now, I liked that aspect of these cards, which kind of further states that the family would have been involved in this marriage slash business transaction. And I like how the guidebook says that one has a happy face and one has like a stern face. Like, she ain't really sure if this is a good match or not. <laughs> but a poor choice would have been bad for the entire family if that was made. So the choice here, because the lover's card is all about choice, right? Now, I don't want to put traditional tarot meetings onto a deck like this that has its own kind of stories to go to back the meetings up. But in my terms, in just like an underlying level, the lover's card is about choice. Now here, the choice is about looking at our attachments, business transactions, kind of like looking at our relationships and which ones are benefiting us, which ones aren't serving us and things like that. Who are the outside? Who's getting influenced outside of those relationships, whether it be in the workplace or at home or your life partner? Like who outside of just those two people or that group of people, who outside is that influencing? Uh, is it a good attachment or is it a negative attachment? Things like that. So I think looking at goals in terms of those relationships is where we, is what this card is signifying. Now, the next one that I was that I pulled was Gullah Jack, which in this deck is the Hanged Man. Now, he had a very, after about, after reading about five articles from him, I was able to get kind of a little bit more of a background than the guidebook suggested. Now, the guidebook did get into a lot of uh, good, like, jumping off points for me. He was a Baconda prisoner. He was sent to Florida under the ownership of a man named Zephaniah Kingsley. Now, in one article, Kingsley had described him as a priest in his own country. So that was pretty interesting. He also said that he was, that Gullah, Jack, carried a conjure bag, a hex bag with him everywhere he went. Now, I'm not sure if in this reference, conjure and hex bag are the same thing. Uh, I don't know, but it said conjure hex bag. So that could have just been um, like an ignorance by that double statement there. Who knows? But he carried that conjure bag with him at all times and he was a and Kingsley his owner said that he was a priest in his own country so I found that to be fascinating also 
that same article described Goa Jack as having this like huge unkempt beard. And so I'm wondering why he doesn't have the beard um, in this portrayal. Uh, I think that in all the references I looked up, it said that he had a beard that was like real full and messy. And I thought, well, that would have been a highlighting feature of his. So I don't know why that's not on this card, but it could have just been, it could have just been a vision of the, you know, creator. So we never know. Now Kingsley then had sold Gullajack to a South Carolina man named Pritchard. And then once Gullajack got over there, he started working in Pritchard's shipyard, uh, probably in South Carolina on a coastal city of, you know, Charleston, some, somewhere like that. Now Gullajack had gotten, I guess he had become acquainted with a man named Denmark Vesey, who I guess talked a lot of people into uh, orchestrating a slave revolt. Now with Gullajack's powers, he was perceived to have powers. In all these, in all this research, he instilled lots of fear and respect amongst a lot of peoples, not just the slaves that were in this revolt with him, but it kind of made him this untouchable person that had powers. He could link to the spirit realm. So people listened to him. So he basically became the front, the front man, the face, I guess you'd say in, in terms of advertising, the face of the slave revolt. Now, betrayal ended up uh, stopping this slave revolt. So unfortunately, all of the slaves were killed and Gullah Jack was one of them. Now, the guidebook says that this card could come up to tell us about our sacrifices and to show us about our sacrifices. Uh, when it's time for a sacrifice, when you have to sacrifice and it be in the good of the whole, it can be the right thing to do. You just have to go with your gut, go with your instinct. And I think that, I think the message here is about if you're stuck, right? When you're stuck, the hangman message is when you're paused or when you're stuck. It's, it's crucial to ask for wisdom, ask for guidance, right? So that when you're no longer stuck or when you're no longer paused in your spiritual practice or whatever you're using tarot for to, to get to the, get to the bottom of, it's about asking for that guidance and that wisdom to know what to do once you're not stuck anymore. Like, you know, once you're unstuck or not paused. Um, so I found that to be really, this was a really immersive story uh, like I said I really had to read like five articles to get like a good kind of a story but the guidebook did a really good job in telling a little bit about his story and then what the card meant so the next two was now as Big Mama had come out like as a jumper at the very end of like my session that I had before starting filming Paul was the last card I think that Big Mama jumped out at the end because she was like, well, you can't have Pa without me. You can't have him without me. And I think that that it was needed to be known that you would have to you would have to need both. Right. So I think it's very cool that I got this Pa and Big Mama here, the moon and the sun card. Also kind of linking us to the lover's card a little bit. So this kind of turned into a pseudo reading for me at the very end of my session with this, with pulling these cards and, you know, getting in touch with self. So I'm not going to go too in depth with that, but it was really cool how it kind of turned into a pseudo reading for me personally. So anyway, this card, Paw, which is the moon card, speaks to secret societies, fraternal orders in the U.S. Black men heavily populized um, many of these. And now... In terms of this deck, the moon is masculine, not feminine, okay? I associate the moon with the feminine, but back in the colonial United States era, okay, the colonial era, the men would have been the ones to hold the secrets, to hold the mystery, to not get, like, let in to their, not let you in on their emotions, not let you in on their private lives and things like that. So the meaning behind this may be that we don't know everything. Right, of course. But furthermore, they may be hidden from you on purpose. There can be things, secrets for people, and you don't know what they are. Lots of people have secrets they're not sharing, and it is about the mystery. But in terms of this deck and its specific time period, the man, or the masculine in this case, would 
hold the mystery. He wouldn't have shared about his emotions or what's his day to day. Now, here's our jumper, the beautiful sun card. I love this image because I have seen this figure before in my life. On Sundays, you go out to the grocery store and it's after church lets out, okay? You see these figures everywhere with their dress suits and their big hats. They're what my mom, what my mama used to call their Sunday best because that's what you did. You dress up to go to church, right? And you wear hats. And so much like the paw card, it shares about the importance of elder wisdom. Both of them kind of have that elder wisdom aspect to them, but none were greater than big mama. Now, she was wisdom, strength, authority, leadership incarnate. She wasn't mysterious. She didn't hold secrets. She told you those secrets. She was the storyteller, right? So just to, I guess, lay it out, I'm believing that this is like a grandfather, grandmother figure that, that's right here. The grandmother and grandfather figures. And she would have been the transmitter of the family history, the lore behind their spirituality, their spirituality in general. And I think I liked that she's in her Sunday best um, because it goes a little in the guidebook about the church being where all of that would have taken place, where that wisdom would have taken place. They would have had these Bible studies and these sermons and they would have gone on to what the families endured to get where they're at now. And it would have been, it really would have been about tying it all together, tying where the family's been and where it's going now. And, you know, it really, there really would have been stories and wisdom and advice in those sermons and the big mama being the matriarch, right? Or all of them that's in this church together, they would have gotten together with their homemade food. Like this is a plate of cornbread, right? Which is a, that's a Southern thing. It's a Southern thing. Um, but they would have gotten together and had food and had stories and it would have been a link, right? In the church. And I think that that's why she's depicted here in her Sunday best. So her message, again, like Paul, lies in knowing you are looked after. I love this line in the guidebook. It says, this is not your time to lay down. This is your time to shine. And I like how it's almost like you can hear her saying this. You can hear her saying this to you. She's got her hat on and she's got a plate of cornbread in front of you. And like, it's just come out of that cast iron skillet and she's slicing it up like a pizza. I don't know. It's just something to remember, right? Now, I wasn't immersed in this world, right? But I was immersed in the South. So there was, I guess, some, in terms of memories and things like that and who I knew and my neighbors and things like that, I can, I can kind of see, I can kind of see this. All right. Now, the next category was family. Now, only two came out. Oh, let's go. Only two came out for family which is the daughter of baskets or the page of cups and the mother of coins, which is pentacles. Now in this, I love that of these, this is, this actually had a person involved as well. This is Tatuba, right? The most famous person in the Salem witch trials. She was actually the first one to be accused of witchcraft in the Salem witch trials. And she was, she was actually, an enslaved teenager. So she was bought and sold to a preacher that lived in Massachusetts. And uh, I think her heritage lies, according to all the articles I read and even the guidebook, she's of South American descent. Um, now, in the guidebook, it says that she was had Arawak heritage, but in the articles I read regarding her, it never actually stated that she was Arawak. Now, it could have just been that from the year she was born, in which country she was born in South America, that could have just been the, the religion or practice that Arawak would have been what they had used, right? From the time she was li lived there until she was sold. So I, I'm just guessing at this point because my research didn't suggest that heritage, but it could just be also that it's closed and they wouldn't have been shouting it from the rooftop. So, you know, there's that. But she was accused of being a witch because her 
and the other two daughters of the preacher, she basically grew up with these other girls, they started going into fits, right? So they get in front of the magistrate and the other the daughters of the preacher, they like deny being involved with witchcraft, but Tatuba was clever, okay? She was like a modern day Scheherazade. She told a very elaborate story to these whole magistrate courtroom full of men and got them so enraptured that they just completely forgot that she was guilty of witchcraft and started hunting the other witches involved and things like that. So the meaning here is on the attributes of this card, being the page of cups here, charm, imaginative, creativity, uh, almost to extent loyalty, the shadow aspect. We could look at the, the fact that she had to lie and kind of use some con artistry to finagle the judges in the magistrate court. So we could go on the, the shadow aspect of that. But really, I think of Tituba as this charming, imaginative creature who regaled everyone with her imaginative story of the devils. And he's got this white beard and he's cloaked and he's from Boston. And these animals talked to me and told me what to do and stuff like that. I mean, she just had all kinds of details. And she was vague enough to where nothing could kind of like really be, co you know, corroborated. So, you know, there's that. So this was a really cool story to look into. And if you know anything about the Salem Witch Trials, you know that she's pretty famous anyway. So it's really, it was really easy to kind of look her up and get her story and things like that. So that was really cool. Um, and then we had the Mother of Coins. Now, this didn't have an actual person or story to it, but I really liked that this was a cozy mother right she's laying in her bed she's got her pets and her herbs and it's all about investing time into yourself and what that looks like and how you go about doing that again it's on the qualities that lie underneath this woman in her bed so it's in tune with nature being surrounded by plants resourcefulness so knowing knowing what makes you comfortable and what what makes you comfortable is being in tune with not only nature, but yourself as well, and knowing the tie there as well. So the mother of coins is really practical, really resourceful. And I liked how in this particular card, it's more so about using all that to be comfortable and be cozy. And I really liked that. Now for the last category, we have the community section, which are the miners. And I pulled four cards. Now I got two of baskets and six of baskets. Now I like how two of baskets like Big Mama was a jumper at the very end. Now I think that it jumped out because I had already gotten these and this card, the six of baskets about this companionship and this young love and things like that, this rendezvous kind of a card in this particular deck, it links me to this may be them when they're older, right? And it's about like the two of baskets is about keeping that relationship alive, knowing what to do, how to finagle, how to balance, um, how to communicate. It's all kinds of things when, when we're talking about the two of, of cups, two of baskets. And so I think that they are really immersed with each other because they already know how to juggle. And it's because of the six of baskets, this rendezvous, they fell in love and or not even at that stage, it was love. It was more a severe friendship. And that's what bloomed. And that's why they're able to communicate really well now. It kind of links me to my own love story, to be honest with you, because I fell in love. Uh, well, I wouldn't call it. It was puppy love back in the day when I was 15, when I met him. But we'd stayed friends. We communicated well with each other. You know, made each other laugh, things like that. We just found ways to keep the, the friendship alive. And then it morphed into love years after that. So, you know, there's that. So it kind of links me to my own love story, but I wanted to kind of go over the herbs too, because there was a big emphasis in herbs in this, especially in the minors. And the herbs here was Santeria, uh, which is a savory plant, which is in the mint family. And it's on sensuality and sexuality and passion. And I thought, wow, that's perfect. And then she, in her basket, is Queen's Delight, which is a root plant. Okay, no surprise there. And it's used, again, in love and romance and attraction. So there was lots of herbs that to do in terms of magic with love and 
you know, sensuality and stuff. So that made perfect sense. With the six of baskets, it was sugar cane. Of course, sugar is give your sweets some sweets. Could be sweet on you. You know, it's a Southern thing. Southern saying. <laughs> it's actually in the guidebook, which I found hilarious that she even put in there. Um, but I really liked this card that came up. But I liked, too, that it linked to the two of baskets in a, in a little bit of a way. So it was cool that that jumped out. Sugarcane and magical workings is again about love and, and relationships. So that, that worked. So the four of knives is this man taking a much needed break, right? Perfect look to this card. He's got his knives on his belt. He's ready in case anything or anyone comes about while he's resting, but he knows he has to rest. He knows that in order to complete his day's mission, or what you know whatever that may be that he needs to rest first so that was pretty cool now i don't see any licorice root uh on the card but i don't think that they're in this one either so some of them aren't present in the cards but it's no matter you can still tell that this is a man needing rest and he's resting so that's this card now this card had an actual story and it was really, really hard for me to research this because it's like religious fanatics, religious justice. And I just, I think I cried through most of this shit because I can't stand justice taken to religious. They like shove them into religious boxes and there's like justification and shit. It's like all the shadow shit you would ever think of in terms of religion. It was like this and... Ooh, it just was hard for me to hard for me to research but basically now because I live here in the south I already knew from looking at this card that this was a church so I was like oh my god who died in this church brutal this is depicting the brutal murder of the spiritual healer George Webster I think it happened in Memphis now the herb with this card was the white rose which I always associate with innocence and like purity so that really touched somewhere close to my heart when it ended up being the white rose. Now, George Webster was murdered in cold blood by a lady's children who are enacting justice because they believed that he had cursed a woman in his congregation. Basically, she started having fits. And I don't know if she accused him or if they just thought that it was like she'd been visiting him for spiritual guidance and she just started having fits. So they tried to like put two and two together, like pseudo detectives or whatever. Well, anyway, they told po the policemen that they had a vision from God that they would kill the preacher that killed their mom. And they were going to do it the same way that David killed Goliath with five stones, but they were going to use five shotgun shells. And that was pretty hard to hear that they used a biblical story to enact this you know, revenge slash justice, this, you know, religious justice or whatever. So anyway, they, they were pretty fanatical and I think that they showed no remorse for the killing. They screamed hallelujah when they realized he was dead. I mean, that shit was hard to hear. That shit was hard. Well, not to hear. It was hard to read. Um, it was a, a hard thing for me to read about because I'm still healing from the the trauma of freaking Christianity. But <clears throat> what really got me was that his death impacted so many people of that town. There were so many people, so many black people that couldn't afford insurance. They couldn't afford insurance to go to the hospitals and go seek medical help. So they went to George Webster for spiritual healing, healing and spiritual assistance and assist, medical assistance. And they used him as a spiritual priest, as a healer, as a conjurer, as a root worker. They used him because they didn't have another choice. And then when he died, it impacted so many people. Like, what did they do? How'd they get help? Now, when this card comes up in a reading... I will think about George Webster and his influence 
over an entire town. You know? So, anyway. All right. Well, I hope you liked this. I hope that this was um, not fun, but I hope it was informative. And I hope that, I hope to continue to, to work with this deck and I hope to continue to research the stories within the deck. And you just use it as tarot, you know? Not so much for the research aspect, but it really did kind of help to separate it and really get immersed with the categories and, the, you know, the elders, family, and community and see some stories and really get to know some of the characters in these stories and in this tarot. If you have anything to add to these people's stories, if you know, please leave it below. I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you. Much love, people.